Hello, and welcome to the introduction to Social Security Disability Benefit Programs and Work Incentives. My name is Lucy Miller, and I'm one of the staff at Virginia Commonwealth University's WIPA National Training and Data Center. And WIPA stands for the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance. That's a, a national program funded by the Social Security Administration that we'll explain all about throughout the course of this particular lesson. Now, this web course has six individual lessons, and each lesson is about an hour. And I will be your presenter for all six lessons. So this lesson, lesson one, it will be covering the problem of unemployment among Social Security disability beneficiaries, and we'll be spending a lot of time describing how WIPA, the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Program, is a major part of the solution to that problem. So without further ado, let's take a look at the objectives uh, that we hope we'll achieve in the next hour. So first of all, we hope that by the end of this lesson that you'll have a better understanding of the issue of poverty as it affects disability beneficiaries, meaning beneficiaries of the Social Security Disability Programs, and also to have an understanding of the efforts that Social Security has implemented to address the problem of disability and poverty being connected. Secondly, we're going to define financial stability and describe how employment supports that particular goal, how employment for disability beneficiaries leads to greater financial stability. Third, <clears throat> we'll identify um, and uh, the key provisions of the Ticket to Work program and describe the role of employment networks within the Ticket to Work program. Now, many of you probably work for employment networks or other agencies that help support people with disabilities in employment, so that part of this lesson may be very familiar to you. Fourth, we hope that you'll be able to describe the key components of the WIPA program. Again, that's the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Program and also describe the role of the professionals who work within that program, folks that we refer to as CWICs. Again, another acronym that stands for Community Work Incentive Coordinators. And we hope that you'll be able to see how CWICs, who work for the WIPA programs, um, really are part of the employment support team surrounding beneficiaries. And you'll have an understanding of how CWICs work collaboratively with other members of that team. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about how various stakeholders can work with WIPA projects to support their shared goals. And all of us probably have the same goal, which is to help beneficiaries maintain employment and to uh, generate money, which leads to a better and more stable financial outcome for them. So. To get started, let's talk a little bit about who Social Security disability benefits are, or beneficiaries are. And some of you may have a lot of experience working with beneficiaries, but others may not. So let's get all on the same page and understand some common characteristics of individuals in this population. First of all, beneficiaries of Social Security's disability programs have very significant disabilities. I think uh, in, in uh, the world today, a lot of Americans may not understand what it takes to be found eligible for these programs. Um, these are programs for people with significant disabilities, not folks that are struggling perhaps with mild um, impairments or conditions. And as you'll see in lesson two in particular, what folks go through during the application and eligibility determined proce process is um, it's significant and these programs really are for people that are very significantly impacted by a disability or multiple disabilities. Secondly, these um, people who are receiving these benefits have typically proven to the Social Security Administration that they're really unable to support themselves by working because of the disability. Um, this, these really are income support programs and or income replacement programs. So it isn't just that you have to have a significant disability to qualify, but that disability has to be causing that individual to be unable to work at a level 
that would be self-supporting. And again, we'll talk about that a lot more in lesson two, but it's something to understand. In the United States, the definition of disability for Social Security is inextricably intertwined with the ability to work. It isn't just a medical determination. It really is also looking at how that disability causes someone to be unable to work at a level that would allow them to be financially independent. Third, a lot of people on disability benefits either have little work experience or they maybe uh, have a work experience, but they may have become disabled later in life and many disability beneficiaries have been out of work a long time. That's something to think about when your goal is to help individuals go to work at a self-supporting level, perhaps for the first time in their whole lives, or um, coming back into the workforce after a long separation. And these are things that this population definitely has in common. Finally, because of the disability, many of the beneficiaries are struggling financially. Um, some of the disability programs, as you'll see, one in particular, Supplemental Security Income, or SSI, these are um, means-tested programs. So in order to qualify, individuals um, are going to have very little income and few, if any, assets or resources. And those individuals are at very low levels of, of, of benefits and typically aren't working, so they may be struggling financially. The other benefit program, Social Security Disability Insurance, for a lot of people on that benefit, they have had to quit jobs, they may have been struggling to be found eligible for benefits for months, sometimes years, and in the ensuing time since they quit work, all of their resources have been depleted. So lots of people receiving benefits in these programs have um, spent their savings. They may have very little other than their disability benefit to live on. And it's something to know that this population typically, not all, but typically is struggling financially. So there is a significant relationship between poverty and disability. And from the previous slide, you can, you can see why that connection is there. Um, some very depressing statistics, I'm sorry to say, are shown on this slide. But again, it's something that, that all of us need to understand as we work together to help people with disabilities go to work and support themselves by working. First of all, it's important to know that the poverty rate for people with disabilities is more than twice the poverty rate for the rest of our population in this country. And that's a compelling statistic. So poverty is prevalent in the disability community. Secondly, more than 70% of SSI recipients, and remember that stands for Supplemental Security Income, that's the disability program that's means tested uh, within the Social Security um, benefits world. Those folks, 70% of those folks are below the federal poverty limit. That's a pretty low standard and that's a pretty high percentage of those beneficiaries to be at that level. 30% of the Title II disability beneficiaries are also having income below the federal poverty level. So again, you see high levels of poverty in the disability beneficiary population. So only about 13% of the Social Security and the SSI disability beneficiaries earned at least $1,000 in 2011. And when you look at that statistic, that's pretty startling. That means that 87% of the disability beneficiaries earned nothing at all or earned less than $1,000. And that's for a whole year, not for a month. So we're seeing here that attachment to work within this population, we've got a lot of work to do. Those are pretty low levels of employment. And for those who are working, the level of earnings is really low. Um, and again, most of us in this country, we, have, we support ourselves by working. So if you're not working, you're relying on these disability benefits, you can see why that might lead to some very high levels of poverty and um, people who are struggling, again, financially. Um, those who worked, uh, the last piece of this particular statistic, 
averaged $637 a month in that year. And think about that. If you're living on $637 of wages in a month, gross wages, that's low income. That would be a struggle. Most of us would not even really be able to conceive of what that might be like. But that's what's characterizing this population. So what are the causes of unemployment among this population? Well, there are three main reasons. And for many people, they're all interrelated. The lack of service and supports that folks need um, to be successfully employed is, significant, um, uh, is a significant problem. People with disabilities often need help getting a job and keeping a job. Um, help from state VR agencies, help from ENs, help from supported employment providers, other agencies out there. And beneficiaries may not have access to services that meet their needs, and this is a barrier. This is why, one of the reasons why, unemployment is so high among this population. Second, fear of losing those disability benefits and the health insurance that comes with the benefits is a major barrier. For any of you who are helping people with disabilities get jobs, you've had conversations with individuals about how frightened they are that going to work will cause the loss of this really important lifeline, the monthly check, and with that, either the Medicaid or the Medicare, that really critical health insurance coverage. And people with disabilities, understandably, are afraid that going to work will cause a loss of those benefits, a significant reduction, and certainly a loss of health care. So it's something we have to consider when we're helping people go back to work or go to work um, for the first time. And then finally on this slide, beneficiaries may believe that they are incapable of working due to their disability or certainly incapable of working at a level that would be self-supporting. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. Um, when you go through the Social Security Disability Benefit application process, there is that significant attachment of work and disability. Um, and so folks come through that process, they are really concerned that their disability is going to make it impossible for them to work at any kind of level that would be self-supporting. So we have a lot of work to do here with these three issues. So Social Security is very well aware of, of these barriers. And for many years, the agency has been doing a variety of things to promote employment and improve the financial stability of the disability beneficiaries. We're going to talk about some of the initiatives that are very recent, um, rather than focusing on the long history here. But, but I do want to make sure that you understand there are lots of things that have been going on over a period of many years to try to help people with disabilities go back to work or work for the first time. On this slide, some of the most important recent programs, and we'll talk about each one in detail, um, include the Ticket to Work program. Um, the second one here is Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security, another acronym. If you're not used to it already, you need to, to uh, get accustomed to this. Lots and lots of acronyms, and we refer to this program shorthand by PABS. And the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Program, which we refer to by the acronym WIPA. So let's take a look at each of these. All right, the Ticket to Work program. Many of you may be working for state VR agencies or employment networks, and you may already have a basic familiarity with this really important program, the Ticket to Work program. It was created as part of the Ticket to Work and Work Incentives Improvement Act of 1999, and it's hard to believe that it was that long ago that this landmark legislation was passed. We refer to it sort of shorthand as just the ticket legislation. Well, what did this program do? It provided uh, beneficiaries with expanded access to service providers, what under the ticket program we refer to as employment networks or ENs, and state VR agencies that help beneficiaries prepare for employment help beneficiaries get jobs and help beneficiaries be successful in maintaining employment over time with that broader goal being greater financial independence. The ticket program also provides 
while the individual is receiving the services and using their ticket, an exemption from medical disability reviews as long as that ticket is considered to be in use and certain progress standards are, are met. Again, in lesson two, we're gonna talk a lot more about the components within the social security program like the continuing medical review or CDR, continuing disability review, I'm sorry, that all beneficiaries have once you're on benefits, you're not in for life, you have to continue to go through medical reviews to document to the Social Security Administration that you continue to be meeting the disability standard. And one of the benefits of using your ticket in the ticket program is that while you're making certain progress, you will not be subject to the CDRs, the medical disability review process. And that's a major benefit for a lot of people receiving social security disability benefits. There's a lot of fear of those medical reviews. And in this program, you, are, um, you don't have to go through those reviews as long as your ticket's in, in use. So let's talk a little bit about the next program, the Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security, or PABS. And this is a program that helps people with disabilities who receive SSI or Social Security Disability Insurance, commonly referred to globally as SSDI, um, who have a disability-related employment issue. So it kind of expanded the network of protection and advocacy programs to really focus on beneficiaries, Social Security Disability beneficiaries, who have perhaps a barrier to employment um, that is advocacy related. So the PABS advocates can provide legal support, advocacy, and information and referral to help beneficiaries resolve employment related concerns. The PABS programs vary widely by state. So for you in your home state, if you need to find out more about how your PABS operates, you would want to contact your state protection and advocacy program for more information. Now this is kind of a nice segue for me to make some reminders um, to those of you listening to this to be sure that you're looking at the additional resources under each lesson. There's um, readings that we hope that you've already read before you're watching this video and participating in the lectures, but there's also in every lesson a long list of additional resources. And for this lesson, we've listed lots of resources that you can look at to help you understand the PABS program in general, but also to find the contact information for your PABS program in your state so that you can go to their website and read specifically what your state program does, because they all do vary uh, to some extent. So you'll need to do a little bit of research, but hopefully we've made that somewhat easy for you to do. So now let's talk about the WIPA program, the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance. And again, all three of these programs were created by that ticket legislation that was signed by the president in 1999 and really became operational in the year 2000. So the WIPA program was created by that legislation and the purpose of this program was to help with that one barrier we discussed a couple of slides back related to how fearful beneficiaries are that paid employment will cause the loss of critical income support programs like SSI or the cash benefits they're receiving under SSDI and their Medicaid and their Medicare. Under the WIPA program, there has been a large cadre of people all across the country created to be experts in what happens to your benefits when you go to work. And these experts work with beneficiaries individually to really plan about what's going to happen to your specific benefits when you take the job that you're planning on and really digging in and doing that individualized counseling. Now, Social Security is currently contracting or having cooperative agreements, that's the correct phrase, with 83 different community agencies all across the nation and in our U.S. territories to provide the WIPA services. So that's an important point to understand right there. Social Security is the funder, but they don't provide these services in-house. They pay community organizations to deliver this important um, service. 
Now, the WIPA programs, uh, as we indicated earlier, are staffed by experts, and these experts are called Community Work Incentive Coordinators, or CWICs. And these folks go through some very intensive training and evaluation so that they have a strong understanding of the work incentives that are built into the Social Security Disability Benefit Programs and Medicaid and Medicare, as well as other income support programs that beneficiaries may be receiving, like SNAP, um, which is what we refer to as the food stamp program now, or HUD housing subsidies. Any of those things um, may be infected by work, and so the CWICs are trained to help beneficiaries understand how a job would affect those important income support programs and health insurance. Um, we'll go over a list of all the different services that WIPA providers deliver uh, towards the end of this lesson. Now, to date, the WIPA projects across the country, because they've been operational since about the year 2000, have served more than 750,000 individuals with disabilities. So that's a lot. Um, there's a lot of impact there. And really continuing to work on that one barrier that's all about the fear that beneficiaries have that working will somehow negatively impact their ability to support themselves with that benefit check and also the fear of the loss of the Medicaid and Medicare. So let's take a look at the WIPA program. Let's dig in a little bit so that you'll have a stronger understanding of how this service works and what the folks that you serve um, can get out of this program if they're referred. Well, first thing to understand, WIPA is very focused benefits counseling and it's focused on work issues. We always say that WIPA is all about work and the mission of the WIPA program it's here on this slide, is to promote employment and financial independence for beneficiaries of the Social Security Disability Benefit Programs. So it isn't just benefits counseling. It isn't just helping you understand how the disability benefits work or how to apply for those benefits. It's not that at all. It's really employment focused, um, like a laser beam. That is what these CWICs are focusing on. Let's help beneficiaries understand the impact of paid employment on these benefits with the mission of helping people work to the greatest extent possible and to experience much better financial outcomes at the end of the day. So here are some of the objectives that the WIPA projects and the CWICs who work within them have in their minds as they do their work. First. Our mission in this program is to increase the number of Social Security Disability beneficiaries who engage in paid employment or self-employment. And really, that's all about helping folks dispel a lot of that mythology that's out there that's causing people to be fearful and that may cause people not to work because of that fear. So hopefully, if we can provide correct information and encourage beneficiaries, more beneficiaries will choose to engage in paid employment. Secondly, our mission is to support beneficiaries in maintaining employment or self-employment over time. That's a critical thing to understand too. It isn't just about helping that person take that first step along the employment continuum, but to take the next step and the step after that and to move forward into self-sustaining employment and to be successful over time doesn't do anyone any good if a beneficiary is able to get a job but then not able to maintain it. So you'll see when we talk about WIPA services being proactive and being uh, long-term in nature, that's what uh, we're really getting at here is helping people uh, be in employment, be successful in employment over time. Third, we hope to provide accurate and timely work incentives planning and assistance services that enable beneficiaries to increase their earnings capacity over time and maximize the financial benefit from working. So again, it isn't just about taking that first step on the road to employment. It's about continuing to move forward. It's about continuing to get jobs that pay better, maybe with more hours, and sort of smoothing out that transition from dependence on benefits to a self-supporting life from working. And that's really our ultimate goal, and that's what WIPAs are working towards every day. 
fourth, we hope to reduce beneficiary dependence on the Social Security Disability Benefits and other income support programs that we mentioned earlier. And remember, that's really the goal of all of this. Poverty and disability, uh, life of disability benefits, those things go together. Poverty isn't a good thing to the extent that we can move people into employment and people can earn more over time, that leads to a much better financial outcome for folks. And that's what we're working on over time. And finally, global mission is to increase the financial independence and the stability of beneficiary through that self-sustaining employment, asset development, and improved management of fiscal resources. And I bet that those of you participating in this course didn't realize that the larger goal of financial independence and stability was part of the WIPA program. Yes, it's benefits counseling. Yes, it's employment-focused benefits counseling. But the broader outcome that we want to achieve is a group of people who are more financially independent and more stable through employment. So that really is the end goal that we're trying to achieve. So there are some key characteristics of the WIPA program that you need to be familiar with or aware of. And here on this slide, you can see these four characteristics, and we'll explain each one in detail. First, uh, the entire program is based on collaborative partnerships. This isn't where a CWIC takes a beneficiary off into an office and by themselves delivers some counseling. This really is intended to be very collaborative service, where the CWIC is working not only with the beneficiary, but with all of those members of the employment support team so that everyone understands the impact of that individual's employment goal on that individual's unique constellation of benefits. Second, it's, as we've described on the previous slide, really focused on improving that larger financial stability and independence of each disability beneficiary. It's not just about getting a job, right? It's about really having that more global, uh, fi better financial outcome based on work. Third, WIPA services are really intended to be highly individualized, intensive, and ongoing. This isn't supposed to be just sort of global information and referral where um, you may be taking large groups of beneficiaries and speaking in very general terms. That is part of WIPA services, but that's not the real meat of what we do. Our value added is that individual meeting with a specific human being looking at their unique employment goals, their unique benefits situation, and explaining that in a very customized and individualized manner. And finally, WIPA services are delivered by this cadre of, of very skilled people, we refer to them as CWICs, who have been trained and have ongoing training requirements and have gone through a pretty rigorous assessment and certification process. As you'll see by the time you finish these six lessons, the material is complicated. It's highly complex government regulation that surround the benefits and that um, the impact of work can be complicated. So it requires a group of very trained and uh, certified professionals to be able to deliver the professional counseling. That's really that meat of the WIPA program. So let's look at each of these a bit, a bit more. So what do we mean about the collaborative partnerships? Well, again, we don't want to take a beneficiary and go sit in an office and just have that counseling be with the beneficiary and no one else. Everyone who is supporting a beneficiary to achieve an employment goal needs to be aware of the impact of that person's employment goal on their benefit so that we can all work together to support that individual to achieve their employment goal. The other issue is there are lots of work incentives built into these benefit programs, several of which um, actually can help a beneficiary achieve their goal. We will go over those, I think, in lessons four and five in particular, but they're sprinkled all throughout the disability benefit programs. So there are some interesting work incentives that can be um, a part of the achievement of that occupational goal, and you'll see that as we move forward. So what are the other, other agencies that CWIC should be reaching out to? 
employment networks, right? State VR agencies, the overwhelming majority of the people served by WIPA projects are also receiving services by either an EN or a state VR agency. Certainly there's overlap with the PABS program that we talked about earlier, Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiary of Social Security. Um, the American Job Centers, previously known as the One Stop Career Centers, um, certainly staff there provide valuable services that the folks with the project served need to avail themselves of. Public school systems, because as you'll learn, WIPA programs can serve folks all the way down to the age of 14. That may not have been something that you knew. So many of the folks that we might be working with are still engaged in public schools. And certainly those transition programs there and special education programs, those staff also need to understand how that student's employment goal might affect their benefits, right? And then, you know, other public disability services providers or private um, community rehabilitation providers, anyone who is engaged in serving a person with a disability can be a part of that employment support circle for that individual. And the WIPA project serving that person would need to know all of those agencies and should be reaching out. Again, we're all supposed to be working together to achieve that common goal, which is the financial independence and stability through successful employment. So through the WIPA services, as we've said several times, the end goal is financial stability. So it's probably a good idea that we explain what that means. So when we're working with beneficiaries, CWICs have to keep that bigger picture in mind. While they're promoting employment, uh, and that's a critical part of their job, the more important outcome is improved financial stability. So it's a bigger um, picture than just that job. Employment is certainly a means to that end, but attaining true financial stability is more than just getting a job. And you know, all of us uh, understand that, right? It's all about managing your money that you earn. It's about um, other factors in your life, like having health insurance that meets your need. You may have family members that are dependent on you. Lots of things to consider. And part of a CWIC's job is to look at that bigger picture, not just to be narrowly focused on the job, getting a job, but to work with people long term to move forward in employment that leads to that stable financial outcome. So defining financial stability within the WIPA program, this slide explains to you how we define that when we're doing our work. It's having enough money to avoid lifelong poverty and reduce or eliminate the dependence on the disability benefits or other income support programs. Being able to meet your basic um, living expenses, right? That's what we all want. And people with disabilities are certainly no different. It's having enough income to live independently or as independently as possible and to pursue our chosen lifestyles, right? When you're living in poverty, these are things that you're constrained against. You can't achieve that lifestyle that you may have as your dream, but as you work and achieve greater financial independence, those are things that um, those dreams start to come true. Maintaining employment that meets an individual's economic or personal goals provides fringe benefits, right? Vacation time, sick time, the medical insurance, and that offers long-term security. These are things that all of us are seeking um, in terms of financial independence and stability. Next is having the ability to ma manage your own finances, to save for the future, to access support that's necessary to make fa sound financial plans. And finally, for beneficiaries in particular, is the power and ability to manage your own benefits to the extent that you retain some of these benefits as you go to work. That includes monitoring the use of work incentives and reporting your wages and in the case of some social security programs, other relevant information so that your benefits um, aren't messed up and everything stays straight and that you can smooth that transition again from dependence on those benefits to that more independent life um, with earnings. When we're delivering work incentives, planning, and assistance services, the real 
power, the jewel, I guess, within the WIPA program is the individualized services that CWIX provide. It's really the cornerstone of the WIPA program, and it includes lots of different things. But on this slide, we can summarize the most important aspects of this service. It's in-depth, personalized benefits analysis that covers all federal, state, and local benefits. So it's bigger than just Social Security disability benefits. Lots of people that we serve receive other types of income support programs, as we mentioned, things like SNAP or housing support through um, federal, state, or local programs, and lots of other things too, like unemployment insurance, workers' compensation. There may be lots of other things at play with a specific beneficiary that a CWIC needs to be aware of and that needs to be provided individualized counseling around. There's customized counseling within this service about the impact of work on all of those federal, state, or local benefits. And the, the result of that analysis and that counseling is a written comprehensive report that we call a Benefits Summary and Analysis. Here's another acronym, BSNA. That's what we refer to it as. And the BSNA is not the service. It's kind of the documentation of the service. It's a written report that identifies all of the different benefits that could be affected by working and makes recommendations to the beneficiary about work incentives that could be used to achieve the occupational goal. It provides detailed and specific information about how that individual's employment goal will affect their constellation of benefits. And it's a report that can be shared. It's a report that anyone who's in the employment support circle around that beneficiary should have a copy of, with the beneficiary's permission, of course, so that we're all singing from the same page, from the hymnal. Everybody knows what to expect, and everybody knows what specific work incentives are available to that individual that could help them achieve their goal maybe more quickly or um, and remove some barriers to employment. Finally, the assistance with identifying, developing, utilizing, and managing all of these work incentives. And by the time you get through lesson six, you'll see there's kind of a bewildering array of work incentives. All of them are different. Some of them are pretty complicated. And the value of that really trained and well-experienced CWIC is that they understand how all of these programs work how all of these programs interact with one another, and they're that local expert that can provide that advice to the beneficiary about how best to utilize work incentives to achieve that employment goal, long-term goal of greater financial independence and stability. So some other things, um, it's more good news here, right? Assistance with resolving problems related to benefits. I know in a perfect world, um, we would all hope that nobody's benefits um, gets messed up or problems occur, but in real life, this is what happens. So fortunately, with the WIPA CWIX out there, when something occurs that's problematic, you have an expert there to jump in and to help. Now, our focus is primarily on issues related to employment, but for a, a beneficiary who's high priority and is receiving WIPA services, CWIX can assist with other benefits issues as well, not just employment related issues. And um, these things can get kind of complicated, so it's nice to know that you do have someone within your state who can assist with problems as they arise. Certainly, we help a lot with um, identifying and resolving barriers that beneficiaries may experience in getting a job or keeping a job. And again, this is another service that we offer that folks may not be aware of. We will be talking with the beneficiary about, here's your goal, what are the problems that you foresee, and not just benefits related problems, but other barriers or issues that might pop up. And we're here to provide that information and referral to get any barrier that a person is experiencing that's causing them not to be successful in getting a job or keeping a job, to overcome those. And that's what CWIX are focused on. We can make referrals for needed services and supports with a particular emphasis on meeting employment needs, but we can certainly go beyond that. 
and training and support on providing um, that information to Social Security and the other administering agencies, that's critically important. To avoid problems with any of the federal, state, and local benefits, there has to be communication between the beneficiary and that those agencies. CWICs are experts in this area. They'll provide information to the beneficiary about how to communicate with Social Security and other agencies, how to report the wages, how to report other relevant information, because some of the benefits do require reporting beyond just earnings. And we're standing behind the beneficiary, watching, supporting, making sure that things go well and that there aren't problems that occur. And if problems do occur, the CWIC is there to help resolve them. So one of the things that I don't think a lot of folks are aware of is how ongoing WIPA services can be and how proactive CWICs are in providing the services that, that they provide. Many beneficiaries need more than just that initial counseling, the development of that benefit summary and analysis report. A lot of people, particularly folks once they become employed, they need that ongoing checkup. They need that CWIC to be sending them an email, calling them on the phone, checking to see how are things going? Any issues? Have you gotten any letters from Social Security that we need to be aware of? And just providing that support, that stable ongoing support to avoid problems and resolve problems. Now, ongoing follow-up in the WIPA program is guided by a written plan, right? This is probably no different from the way you provide your services in the agency that you work for. In human services, a written plan is very common, right? State VR agencies write a plan, ENs have a written plan, and WIPAs do too. Now, ours is called a work incentives plan, and it really is benefits focused um, around employment issues, but certainly can include some other things as well. So when we're meeting with beneficiaries, we're looking long term. What is the interaction you need from me, the CWIC, to support you to be successful over time? And as time goes on, that work incentives plan is revised as goals and objectives are achieved, new goals and, and objectives are identified, and the CWIC works through those over time. Now, follow-up, again, in the WIPA program is to be based on an individual specific need. So it isn't cookie cutter. It isn't one size fits all. Some people require a lot of long-term support, maybe very intensive support over a long period of time. Other people might need intensive support for a very short period of time. Other people may need just sort of regular checkups, kind of a low-intensity schedule over a period of time. The sky is the limit on this. It really is about what does that particular human being need, what are their goals, and then the CWIC develops that follow-up plan based on that specific person and what they need. Um, that's follow-up. So let's take a look at the fact that WIPA services are delivered by this cadre of experts, as I described them. These are CWICs. And um, this, is, this is a tough job, and it requires a great deal of intensive training. There are ongoing training requirements um, for these professionals, and a pretty rigorous testing, like an assessment process, that's required to achieve the certification. This is a Social Security designed certification. Um, to provide CWICs or uh, WIPA services, CWICs have to receive a level five federal government suitability determination. That's a pretty intensive process as well. So that's like a security clearance type of thing. And everyone who is delivering the services under the WIPA banner has to have achieved this suitability clearance. Um, these staff people also have to complete a, an, an initial training that is um, rigorous. It's five full days of training and a two-part assessment process to achieve just initial certification. Um, there are even some supplementary trainings that have to be completed after that initial training is done in order to achieve certification. So information and being competent in this job is critically important and CWICs never graduate. 
you become initially certified, but there's ongoing training requirements as well. Um, we call these CCCs, that's Continuing Certification Credits, and there's a certain number of these credits that CWICs have to complete every year after they've gotten their certification. Now, CWICs have access to technical support by my team. Um, that's what I do, and all my colleagues at VCU's National Training and Data Center, and um, our team is sort of a help desk for the CWICs and uh, the certified community partners that have gone through the certification process. And so when you're working with beneficiaries, when a problem comes up, you get a head scratcher, you're not quite sure, you have access to one of my team members so that we can provide technical support, additional training, and it's a very valuable aspect of the WIPA services and something that really delineates WIPA services from other types of benefits counseling is this access to ongoing training and technical support um, from my team. Now, for those of you who may be interested in becoming certified, in Lesson 6, we'll kind of uh, provide you with a bit of an overview on that and some instructions on where you can go to get information. If you finish six lessons and you kind of become bitten by the bug, you like this stuff and you want more, um, we'll provide information about how you too possibly could become a certified community partner um, or work for a WIPA project. So supporting beneficiaries in pursuit of employment is a team effort, right? The barriers that beneficiaries face are significant in some cases. And if we don't all work together, we'll never improve this situation. We'll never really break that um, connection between poverty and disability. So disability service providers and the WIPA projects share that same overarching goal. And I'm sure you have the same goal, which is to promote employment and financial stability for Social Security disability beneficiaries. If you didn't have that same goal, you wouldn't be participating in this course right now. All of the stakeholders have to work together. We don't want to be working at cross purposes, uh, pulling against each other, but we want to be working collaboratively. And WIPA projects are totally unable to meet the work incentives counseling needs of all beneficiaries. We need your help which is why we're offering this course, why Social Security felt like offering this course was, was such an important um, idea. And we need you to have some basic knowledge about how benefits affect benefits so that we can all work together to overcome fears that beneficiaries have so that we're all providing some accurate information and helping beneficiaries understand the reality, um, not myths about benefits and work, but the reality of how benefits are affected by work so that we'll all be more successful. So we're here working together um, and we're so happy that you're participating in this course because the more you know, the more collaboratively you can work with your local WIPA provider as well and the more we can work with you. So what is the message? If we're not all saying the same thing, if we're not all together on the message, then we're working at cross purposes. And the message on this slide is really what the WIPA projects are trying to communicate, not just with beneficiaries, but their family members and other stakeholders, yourself included. We want everyone to be talking from the same um, place, to be communicating the same message, to be consistent. First, it's important that everyone understand paid employment and social security disability benefits don't have to be mutually exclusive. Beneficiaries are very frightened that they have to choose between working and then having this wonderful safety net in the cash benefits and the health insurance. That's not true. We can be much more individualized than that, okay? Secondly, it's possible to work even full time and keep your critical health insurance coverage like your Medicaid and or your Medicare in almost every case. This is such a fear that beneficiaries have, that going to work for one minute is gonna cause the loss of those critical health programs. That's not true. Even working full time, it's possible to keep your Medicaid if you need it, or your Medicare, and we can talk about that in great detail as the six lessons roll out. 
Third, it's possible to work and come out ahead financially even if those income support programs are reduced. This is something that it takes all of us talking to beneficiaries about because it's human nature to look at something that is being reduced and to feel that there's a loss rather than looking at the bigger picture, which is the combination of the benefits perhaps being reduced and the wages that are being earned that create a better financial outcome overall than total dependence on benefits. But it's something that we need everyone to communicate consistently because beneficiaries do sometimes get too focused on the reduction in those income support programs rather than looking at the fact that their financial position is being improved significantly by wages. So we all kind of have to be cheerleaders and encouraging folks to look at the bigger picture, not focusing on the reduction of income support programs. And finally, for those beneficiaries who work their way off of benefits, and, and that is an ultimate goal of ours, if a person has that ability to do so, that if something happens, if you become ill, if you lose your job, um, it's possible to get your benefits back again. This is such an important message. Beneficiaries believe, unfortunately, that it's kind of a one-time per lifetime, per customer deal. It isn't like that at all. And throughout the six lessons, we'll reiterate multiple ways that beneficiaries who let go of cash benefits because of work can get those benefits back again when they're needed, if something happens and there's a separation from work or a reduction from work. Again, these are the four messages, and we all have to be singing these, shouting these from the rooftop at every opportunity, and everyone being consistent in communicating these four really important and really true uh, messages. So what can you do to help? Well, hopefully, um, you already have some idea of what you can do to help, or you wouldn't have um, enrolled in this course. It helps everyone, beneficiaries, us, um, everyone that you serve, if you can come away from this course with a very basic understanding of how earned income affects Social Security benefits, and if you can explain the basics in very simple terms. No one expects you to complete these six one-hour lessons and be at the level that a certified and experienced CWIC would be at. No one expects that but it would really help us if you can have the basics down, understanding the difference between the disability benefits, understanding the basics about how work affects those programs and their associated um, health insurance, and consistently communicating the four points of our message that were on the slide previously. We hope that you'll have some awareness of some of these sort of fancy bells and whistles, the work incentives that are embedded in these disability programs, that can help people achieve their employment goals um, more quickly or in a more satisfying way, or that ease, that transition between dependency on benefits and a self-sustaining like, uh, life through work. And the more you know about these specific work incentives, the more informed you are and the more you can help beneficiaries understand those. Again, no one expects you to be at the certified CWIC level, but if you have at least an awareness of these special work incentives so that maybe you can identify folks who would be eligible and that will help you make referrals for benefits counseling as well. We really need your help with um, supporting beneficiaries to understand and comply with reporting requirements. Um, the number one reason why people end up uh, with problems in their benefits is because they don't understand how to communicate with Social Security or other agencies that administer the income support programs. They don't know what to tell those agencies. They don't know how to do that. And while CWICs do a lot of that upfront work, we need your help too. Um, for those of you who are on the front line of helping people get jobs, the more we can all work collaboratively on this particular effort, the more we keep beneficiaries out of trouble, the more smooth that, that whole process goes, and no one ends up with benefits that are um, messed up because of um, an avoidable mistake. And finally, we really want you to recognize 
high priority WIPA candidates because we need you um, to make referrals. We, we know that you're spotting beneficiaries, you're helping people get jobs, and that's the population who could really benefit from our program. So there you have it. We've come to the end of lesson one. That wasn't so bad, right? So let's talk a little bit about what we've covered in the past hour and what you can expect. Um, we introduced the connection, the unfortunate connection, between poverty and disability. We talked a lot about why unemployment is so high for people with disabilities. We went over some of the important initiatives that Social Security has embarked upon through the Ticket to Work legislation that are hopefully making this issue of poverty and disability less of a connection by supporting more employment. Um, and we've also discussed that overarching concept of financial stability. It isn't just about getting that job, right? It's about getting the job, moving on to more hours, better jobs, the end result me being a more stable financial outcome for the beneficiary. Work is part of that, it's a critically important part, but it's bigger than that. We wanted to make sure that you understood that. And now next, as we move on into lessons two, three, four, five, six, we're gonna provide you with specific information about the disability benefit programs and what happens to those benefits when people go to work. So lesson two is up next, and we really advise you don't go out of order with these lessons. Move through them sequentially because the information does build one lesson upon the next. And lesson two, we're gonna provide you with a basic overview of the disability benefit programs so that you have um, sort of that base that you can work off of as we move into the more complex information. So there you go, that's lesson one. We'll see you in lesson two, thanks.